I hope uh, the view is okay. The presentation can be seen by everybody. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so thank you for, for inviting me to this session. So I'm Adrian Bello, Senior Architect in Red Hat and Consultant. So my experience on, on refactoring application, I would like to talk about today about high level concepts for zero downtime application upgrade. And I think this is a most of requirements for the customers aim to to reach, uh, especially when moving from the monolith. And we know that there are some um, problems when you want to upgrade and all those long weekends you do uh, trying to upgrade application with the database rollbacks and forward and a lot of coffee, of course. Um, from from my um, so the following um, story will be also based on my experience as a database administrator background. Um, so I know also the side of those guys. Let's say being one of them at that time. Um, so traditional upgrade lifecycle, we know already um, that. Usually you don't shut down of the application, upgrade the database, upgrade the application, and start the application when you have a new version of the monolith. So we can see that the database is kind of bottleneck here because we can have like a standby data application with a new version of just the traffic in that run. But from database will be harder to achieve, especially that when you have complicated database schemas, triggers. A lot of constraints and all those uh, business logic they building in the database. So, from um, from the database perspective, uh, that's an upgrade of database. We can see that we we should have the database in admin mode, the read only, even if that would be a luxury for application to still be able to access the read in the database in read only mode. Then uh, back up the database, run the upgrade. You hope that it's not going to be anything wrong, so you don't have to roll back before the point of no return, because maybe it will take another two hours just to get uh, back. But if something happened after the point of no return, you have another hour, because maybe you have to uh, fix that one, and the doubt time will just extend. So the application will not be available to the users. And if everything happened, it's OK at the end, so database online. So I will try to bring some ingredients in this conversation today with you. So it will not be like an only presentation with my experience, but I would like also to engage you with, in this conversation, these concepts I'm trying to, to bring. Um, so we're going to maybe roll back versus roll forward, schema evolution, and backward forward compatibility. We have the blue green canary release. We know CI/CD, microservices, and test-driven development, and just automate the whole pipeline. So, how we run database upgrades? We usually we run it um, we, traditional. We have external tools like Wikibase, Excel Deploy, or manual or automated DB SQL scripts. In, in principle, yeah, that's can bring some challenges, especially now with the cloud native applications, when you run application in the cloud, when you have isolation uh, on the network from database perspective. Uh, you cannot access it only from the cluster self networking, so you don't really how you plug in that tool to run the upgrade. Um, then once you go to splitting the database for the microservices, you may have to upgrade to different databases, kind of database in the same time for that microservice. So it would be, for example, a relational database, NoSQL database, or a blob storage um, service. So if we think about then having the database as a new facelift, and which help the isolation of the microservice upgrade, because splitting the, the monolithic microservices give us possibility to have different upgrades of different components of the application. But that was not the case with the database. So trying to speed that one, uh, we need some transformation of the database. And I think um, 
first step is just to, to get rid of the whole business logic which is around the database, which is very, very difficult task, and I know that. So we think about here the foreign keys constraints, triggers, store procedure, external ground jobs which are still running on that database. So it's very, very difficult. Um, then the second part will be to isolate the data which is corresponding to a specific microservice. So to map like one approximately one to one. For example, customer microservice, uh, customer table, and so on. So we see that we evolve from a relational database where the monoliths are um, living now, and that you have parts can be split in, in different types of persistence. We can, we can say, call it like that, not especially database. You can still have relational database parts of, of that splitting, but you're going to have graph database, no SQL, in memory database, object based storage. So that's becoming more complex how you deal with those. So you need a tool for everyone, and you still need access to that one. A lot of people will have access to the data that's also another point security of the information. Um, so, new possibility like separation of concerns, microservices, different end connection users. We can even have microservices with different connection to the database um, the user than other microservices if we have some requirements, special requirements for database to isolate that part of the data. Think about here maybe you have the credit card holders and, and you have the credit card data with all cheap and application. And so maybe to access the credit card data where all the applications encrypted are stored, you may use another user for access to the database. You know, this way you can separate really from uh, that perspective. Oh, and of course, it's possible to use more than one type for the same microservice. For example, with the graph database and object storage database, we all remember we have those self-reference tables with a foreign key and primary key in the same table. Um, so you can have employee hierarchy and with a graph and employee photo with storage object-based storage, which traditionally was one table, big table with all those references and with the blob you have to manage from the part of the database. But before we move forward to see how we can maybe upgrade this database in the matter that in the zero downtime is achievable or closest to zero time time, uh, I want to, to touch a little bit the rollback versus of road forward when it's coming to the upgrade of the database. So let's just a small example here. So we have an expired date of Mozilla subscription, the 30 days that we need to operate to upgrade to the database. And um, we have version one, which is like the experience date, and the version two will be expired date plus 30 days. It's a very simple operation you, you do that. Um, in a scenario of rollback when you upgrade the database, so we just upgrade the version two of that microservice of the database. We run, we make a typo, and we have 20, you see, and the database will be 2.0. So we just realized that we create with that nice mistake, and then we need to roll back. Traditionally, we do a rollback on that one. So that means downtime. In the same time, then uh, running again the 2.0, and we fix it. But we get a new version of the that change of the database, the delta. So we, we can see that we run to zero upgrade, and we 2.1, so it's, it's more changing in the database happening. If we don't do rollback, but we do do roll forward, so instead of doing rollback, we don't do rollback, but we do an update with the delta of the mistake we just created, then we can see that the change in the data state will be in sync with that, the microservice of the scripts running that change. And from benefits point of view, we have a consistency between what code and the data format and data state, but also will be faster, no rollback. 
and it reduces the risk of downtime. So then, how about the microservice running the database upgrade? So let's think about here, if we want to achieve this, I think we need, in product is we need some metadata regarding the structure version of the data and data self in which state it is. Think about the, in, in JSON format in NoSQL database, it will be maybe easy to achieve that one. We can have a version of the structure and we can see if we change it or not. Um, so from upgrade point of view, we have two operations. Usually it's done on uh, DDL and DML operation we have to run. So that are definition language operations, and we try to don't do this destructive here. So not remove a column or something like that, which actually is creating more destructive. But for example, adding columns, modifying columns format, changing columns, usually those relational database can be done without yeah, still being on live. Uh, and data manipulation language, and some bulk updates, delete inserts. But that means we can do this from the readiness probe. Using containers, we still have the readiness probe, but not really, I think, we are making use of that functionality of Kubernetes, especially when it's coming. I see also this in the customers. Usually it's an empty procedure in the code, which is just turning 200, that everything is fine. Um, some others are checking if the database is online, but that's it. It's not doing really preparing. And I think this can be a place where this upgrade can be checked. So the microservice can check, is my database where I'm connecting expected version? If not, if I have instruction, I just can upgrade that database. So the benefits will be to upgrade on the fly. So run uh, the, the database is ready. Then we can also decide that maybe we don't want to update the whole, the change, the whole data in, in that table we have, but maybe we can change it once we access the data and we upgrade it. So it doesn't have to be in once. Um, we can run in the restricted environment. So the access from the database will be only from the production cluster and not from external tools or from DBAs. Uh, we don't need extra tools to, to do this upgrade because the application knows and how to change the database. He knows what to expect from the new upgrade. And asynchronic BMS, um, just what I mentioned. So for example, imagine uh, we have all the pictures of the employees in JPEG format. And we want to transform that to PNG format. We can run when the new upgrade of that microservice is deployed, go through all images and just convert them, or we just convert them once they are required. So the new version of the application is requires some PNG, is getting a GIF, is converting, is sending the results PNG to the client, but in the same time, it's updating the new format of the data. And then we can also have now the data access in one place. We don't need that separation of concern from DBI administrator because nobody will run an update on the database because that will be the application self. So from our electoral challenges, in, so we try to, to make more complex a little bit of story, um, being also that mobile uh, clients boom from the customers and the challenges. We have a monolith application where we want also to have mobiles. It's nice and it's move forward. But how about the upgrade with mobile applications? Because we have different version of mobile application. We cannot update every application available mobile in the same time. Maybe there are devices which are not supporting the new version of the application, but still we need to run with maybe less functionality also on the previous versions of the uh, mobile application. So then I'm trying to, to bring a concept maybe like a, a blue-green microservice and actually is assuring the forward compatibility of the microservice. So we know that is going to be a change in the data update model and we want to adopt that microservice to be able 
to handle this exception. In the same way, we have the blue-green deployment in Kubernetes where the right traffic depends on the upgrade of the microservice. The same way, the microservice can decide himself once he's testing based on the readiness. Here, the readiness is coming back in the, in the picture, but it's getting more functionality, more role in, in the lifetime of the microservice. He can check if the database version is the same with what is required and is accessing that through that protocol database. If not, if it's changed, he will have in the config map and define what will be the next version. And then we'll just forward to the new microservice that call. And we'll get that uh, information back and he has to transform. So he, here will be a transformation service, actually, from one version to the new one. So if we move forward, let's say to have two version of the same API running in parallel. Then we'll have version of the database is one zero. So now we have only one version running. So we need to prepare this microservice for forward compatibility. So as you see, we have the blue part, which is connecting standard to the database. And we just add the transformation service inside the microservice which is not used yet because readiness is seeing that yeah, you still have the right database version where I can connect. I don't need to connect to something else. The next step will be to deploy the version two, which like I said in previous slides, with a readiness will upgrade the database and the database will get version two. At this point, the forward compatible microservice 1.0 will switch the call to the microservices version two. So on this point, we can assure that also backward compatibility, but also forward compatibility, uh, compatibility will be in, in place. Of course, redirecting traffic between one version one and version two, we need an API manager to do this. So moving forward, Let's add another version. So let's say we're going to have three versions from starting from the picture you saw before with three uh, We have version one, it's already in call. So we need to prepare version two to be forward compatible. We already, if you see here, it's only the blue part because we don't know at that time what will, how it look the new database model on how we need, we need to evolve that microservice. Or if it, it needs a database at all. So we'll be the same. We're going to just add the green the transformation service. And then it's still working. It's not used because the database version is still compatible with the version with application with a microservice version. In this way, we also keep uh, the microservices connecting to the database. We have the same version. And we know from the traditional database model development and upgrades, it was always a different part of versioning microservice in the database model. So you have to always know which application version with which application database version. It will make more simple from that point of view. So just having uh, to conclude, let's say, three microservices. So we have three versions of application running. As you saw previously, deploying version three will just enable the part and then the move forward from 2.0, actually, we'll use the transformation server and not the database direct connection to access the data. In this way, we can chain as long as you want. Of course, it's going to make complex from the chaining perspective, but it's also is giving you um, time maybe to label, duplicate those services. So in, this, in, in the time, you will know how many clients do you still have using that API based on repost from API manager. So that was a little bit about the database role in downtime, zero downtime upgrade. So if you have any questions, and yeah, I would like also to know your thoughts about this.
Yeah, so any questions for Adrian? I know this was supposed to be on the refactoring applications to Kubernetes, um, but. Yes, from refactoring point of view, you're going to reach this problem sooner or, or, or um, because just splitting the code will not be enough. And we are all talking about even driven architecture. How will you react with that one? So we have to react before data is in the database because that's only storage from that point of view. Moving all the logic, which is now triggers, store procedure, which are triggered when the database is changed or the data is changed. So that's, I think this is very, uh, would be like a basic for refactoring the application, analyzing how data is moving through your microservices before splitting the microservices. And then it's giving you also um, a view of, do you want to use another data databases for storing or how you, how you do that, how you can consist all the information you have. And of course, you're going to be the part of data lake and analyze analytics, what you're going to run. But that will be the maybe classical ATL stuff. Adrian, can, yes. can you go to the previous slide? Yes. So maybe which one? No, next. Okay, in, in this one, I see that there's a change from database 1.0 to database 2.0. And then in the next slide, you move from 2.0 to 3.0. No, in the next one, you move from 2.0 to 3.0. So what is the change that is performed in the database? Can you give an example? Uh, can you repeat, please? Yeah, in this case, we are changing the version of the database. Yes. So what is what kind of change is happening in that database? So it's like adding one column to a, a table or something like that, or changing the schema? Yes, it can be that you add, add a column. And how can you perform that change without disrupting the, the service? That's the, the the point because you you run if you add that's why not that I mentioned non-destructive changes to, to the schema to the database. So you just you don't just drop a column, which is used. You just maybe make it, make that column. Uh, depends who's using that column. So it's uh, if your version one is still using that column, for example, um, and from version two you don't use that information anymore. You can see we do a return null for that one because you're going to have that uh, transformation service from two version two to version one. Okay, so the changes you do it from the microservice, and like going back here, so you have the readiness probe. We have the logic. Mm -hmm. We'll start the ugly, and of course you as a developer you know what kind of transformation wants to have in the database. And you have to keep in mind that the transformation we do should be backward compatible in the, in the way, so not be so destructive. If you just want to get rid of a table, you, you may find another way. Maybe you can create a table and then run uh, that migration from one table to the next table based on the read the data and write data. Depends on when you access the data. Because at that time, all the access rewrite will be based on this microservice. So you can control also that on the fly. You don't separate anymore. I need the time only to run the upgrade and then I run the application. You can do in the same time the upgrade. You can even think maybe to have a possibility to have that canary release on the database level from the data perspective. So I'm having the table different version of the data stage. Depends on how they are upgraded, they are accessed. So from, from that, uh, um, yeah, I, it will not be maybe all the cases we cover by this, of course. It can all be a situation where you say, I, I don't know. But if you prepare, 
this transition, I think is giving you more flexibility than we have now. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments? If if not, um, I think what we can do is I was just going to suggest maybe um, I'll put this on the chat in the conveyor Slack too. Uh, yeah, this is more and more uh, often a question asked by the customers: How I can do with your compound upgrade, and especially the problem with database. Great. Um, thanks, Adrian. Thanks for presenting this. Uh, appreciate Thank you taking the time. Um, I put a link in uh, Slack. I'll put it here as well, just in case. But this is to the Miro board that, uh, to be honest, I took took the liberty to add something to there, which is if you scroll up to the top, you'll see something that says day one feedback. Um, if you all could take a minute at the end here to, I just kind of split it into what, what was good, what was bad, what should we do more of, what should we do less of, what should we try. Um, Sorry if it's done incorrectly in Miro etiquette, uh, but well, I uh, maybe if anybody could kind of grab a sticky note and start dropping them on there with what what, what sessions were the most useful, um, you know, what you'd like to see more of, what you'd like to try for the future. Um, uh, and I'll get this over here to. And I know last time we did this um, towards the end, I think, of all the planning, and that's what actually informed us to move to quarterly planning. It actually is what informed us to have field feedback. So uh, it's something that I think the, the core group wants to keep looking at and, um, and using. So uh, if you don't do it now in real time, feel free to do it later too if you're too shy to share what you think. But maybe we'll take a few minutes here uh, to do this. Paige, while people are filling this out, do you want to just kind of briefly touch on tomorrow? It looks like we're starting at eight. Is there anything folks need to be aware of? Uh, nope. Just, uh, yeah, starting at 8 a.m., we've got full day, three sessions, each 90 minutes. Um, I will say, I'll warn you, we didn't have built-in breaks. Um, so just keep that in mind, maybe during your session, if you get the opportunity to end a couple minutes early, just to give folks a break in case they're jumping on the next one. Um, but yeah, other than that, I don't, I don't have any thing to add to that. Great. Thanks. Well, um, you all can certainly feel free to hang out on this, I guess, this Google me while you fill it in. Or if anybody else has feedback or, or something they want to share uh, publicly, uh, feel free to